Okay. <laughs> And come on, there we go. There we go. That one and starts sharing that screen and flip that back on so I can see the chat. Um, let's look aside. There we go. All right, <clears throat> good morning for those that have joined. Chapter three events computer hardware. So this is a follow on, so it's just going to look at some of the BIOS settings and things like that in it. So, nothing rocket science here about any of this. And as the actual Cisco slide themselves were not just straight text in this chapter, I didn't bother um, copying in them and editing them. And I've straight out deleted all of the um, go watch a video slides and that. So you'll get to those while you're reading the material. We don't need them in there. So, all right. So we're going to have a look at the BIOS um, settings and the firmware. Uh, we'll have a brief introduction into wattage and voltage calculations in the electrical power section and then we'll have a look at the cables some of the monitor characteristics we'll look at the raid um, cpu types the two main types there we'll look at possible upgrades that you need to do to computers and the environmental impacts of incorrect disposal of computer related equipment and accessories so booting the computer the first thing it does is it performs a power on self test which basically tests the hardware the main components of the hardware to see whether they are functioning correctly and it will give you a beeping code if there's a problem these codes will provide you with a um, error chart that you'd have to look up no no supply actually supplies their beep codes anymore got to look them up so it basically tells you if the ram ram's not seated properly or or other things like that so um and when the beep cut works <clears throat> it doesn't fire up the rest of the hardware so it is not going to cause any damage to the components in there it'll just tell you something's not not working now bios is a very um, cut down um, control set of instructions and it's the interface between the operating system and the hardware okay so um, along with the post it the biases identifies the drives um, which ones are bootable how the memory is configured how the expansion slots are configured so it controls all the communication functions of the hardware and the operating system so the settings are saved in cmos chip which is I'll let you re read that by yourself. But basically, it is a changeable set of memory and it requires a little battery to keep it charged. Okay, so if the battery, which is only, it's about the size of a 20 cent piece, um, if that battery goes flat, you will lose your CMOS settings on restart. Okay, so basically it'll wipe out the date and time and that sort of stuff on it. Um, 
<clears throat> generally speaking, just get a little screwdriver, pop it out, and it's a standard battery. You just go down to like a, a Mr. Minute or any of those types of places and you'll get a replacement battery. Okay. Unified Extendable Firmware Interface. That's a fancy name, isn't it? So basically this is just giving you all the um, extra settings, if you like, the areas that we play around with when we want to do overclocking and all that sort of stuff. We come in and start having a look at this and it gives us all of our lovely statistics on voltages, temperatures, um, what our fans are doing. So <clears throat> it's a good little thing. Now, common security features is we can have password that um, protection on the various levels of the BIOS. We can do hard drive encryption. We can do secure booting. Yeah. So there's lots of little hardware level security items we can put in place for security. Now, why are we talking about security so early is because the new version of IT Essentials actually has a lot of the introduction to cyber security elements embedded into this new course. So um, it's a good little thing to, to keep in mind. So we'll be introducing some of the um, securing cyber security issues as we go through. Updating the firmware, now, yes, it can be done. Just make sure you have the correct um, firmware for your motherboard or BIOS replacement, because if you get it wrong, you brick your motherboard. So basically what you're doing is you're rewriting that BIOS. So writes out the one you've got there and he installs a new one and if you lose power in the middle of it welcome to a bricked computer so, so there's no way to fix it um if you've got an EEPROM writer yeah you can take the chip out and put it into an EEPROM writer but not from the computer desktop itself okay yeah um, if you've got a donor board, so another dead motherboard that had something else occur on it, you can um, lift the BIOS chip off that one and replace it on the, the working one. Provided um, they're the same. Yeah. Yep. So if they're the same model motherboard, the chip will be the same. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah there are ways of recovering it but generally speaking if it's just because uh, um, basically what you're doing is wiping out that interface between the hardware and the operating system nothing's going to happen so yeah nothing turns on yeah. if that's right so just be careful doing it i have done it several times and i learned the hard way um what happens if you're not paying attention cost me a motherboard <laughs> and what was worse it was for a client so <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah that's rough so that that hurt my hip pocket a little bit that one um it's because i got interrupted and distracted while i was in the middle of it and hit enter without rereading re the screen and it, the screen had told me this is not the same BIOS. <laughs> Don't proceed. Yes, continue. <laughs> yeah. yeah, not good. All right. So, basic electro electrical um, theory voltage measures um, the amount of work required to move a charge along the circuit. The current, which is measured in amperes, is the amount of electrons actually moving through the circuit per second. 
the resistance is the opposition to the flow of that current through the circuit and the power which is watts is the work required to move the electrons um through the circuit multiplied by the electrons that really basically wattage is a ratio of voltage and current so basic equation for ohm's law uh, which you may need to work out your wattage and your power requirements so that um, you can calculate what you need for your power supply so um, vehicles IR so I being the um, current which is amps resistance so the so from that if you can work out your your power because power equals voltage by current so um, the way that I I learned that in school here as a technician way back in the dim dark days yes I was young once and computers were just invented <laughs> when I was young um, basically what you're looking at is we use slightly different terms especially if you're talking with a sparky um, hello it thank you damn fancy electronics what no behave tell you what if I knew how to um I need to change that the pen thank you so in Australia we say what equals voltage over resistance okay so in so we're not playing Zelda are we that yeah, that's not <laughs> the right there's a I haven't done this for a while that's what I want so no thank you what equals V I so basically from that you can do all the calculations so for volts it is watts oh, geez. Oh, I have me thumb on the uh, pen button that won't help so to calculate the voltage is watts divided by current so if you want I is watts over V so as long as you know basically the power the voltage or the current two of those things two out of the three you can always calculate the next one so yeah the yanks go power equals VA so when you're talking to a sparky they'll just put it as uh, watts and voltage and amps WVA they'll they'll use the actual um, calculations so from that so volts amps and resistance which is the Ohm's law so if you need to calculate 
how much resistance is in the circuit. Volts divided by the amps equals the resistance. So by knowing these two laws, you can calculate basically anything to do with the way the power is working in the circuit in the electronics. Now, remember this course is aimed as a technician's course, so knowing how electricity works is kind of fundamental to the requirements of what's going on. Uh, so power supply, voltage settings, um, most of the time now, it is just an automatic switch but on some of the older ones you will find a um, little switch on the back of the power supply that has um, 110 or 240 settings on it and you have to make sure you change it and don't be that annoying little smart ass in the labs that changes the um, set switch from 240 to 110 just to see what will happen. I thought it was the other way to blow up. Well, that's a good way of blowing up the power supply. Oh, is it? I thought if you went from 110 to 240 it would blow up. Uh, no, because in Australia we run 240. Oh, you're right. So okay. We're injecting 240 volts, it's and if you flip, this, flick it to 110 volts, yeah, it's saying I'm expecting 110 volts from the wall, yeah, and you're giving it twice that amount of voltage. The um, transformer blows up. Yeah, no, I I learned that in high school because i think at the high school i went to lost about 60 percent of their computers because a couple kids found out that they could do that yeah so new power supply required and hopefully it's only the power supply yeah and not anything else because the spark or the surge of power that that explosion will cause can actually damage other components in the machine as well Oh, for sure. So it is recommended on an enterprise level that we have um, uninterrupted power supplies. Now, the reason for these is basically conditioning of the power. So with these APSs, you would have normally would have a battery bank attached to them. And basically what they do is they level out the power. So when a brownout occurs, which is a drop in the power that's only for a very short period of time, it will cut over to the batteries. Same with the blackout. It'll run temporarily on the battery and provide power for as long as its battery um, capacity runs. Um, it will reduce the noise on the line, which is basically an uneven AC supply. So just here, so it's got the sine wave. So a clean, not that I can draw nicely, um, sine wave would be relative like that. But it, if you've got interference, what it might do is spike the supply like that and that is noise which disforms the actual sine wave so you're not getting clean power <clears throat> with clean cleaner power you have better performance so spike is the opposite to a brownout it's where the voltage increases above 240 it spikes up to something 
like 280, 290 or something like that for a very short period of time and it can you know cause damage and power surge again surging a spiking of power causing damage so using a surge protector or uninterruptible power supply standby power supplies they all help protect your equipment from these fluctuations now UPSs are the standard um, you'll have in computing and in large installations you'll also have standby power which can be a battery pan bank or um, generators and that sort of thing so it is always recommended that in emergency power management you schedule testing days yes it would um jacob morning by the way um electronic devices run on magical smoke so when the magical smoke escapes from the electronics it, the electronics no longer works because the magic's escaped you see <laughs> i did give you a warning that i do dad jokes in my presentations isn't it? <laughs> so, all right so with architectures we basically have two types one's risk and one's Risk. So, risk is uh, has a very small um, set of instructions that it runs. So it runs them very efficiently and fast. Whereas complex instruction sets, by its name, says it's got a very broad, more complicated set of instructions. It runs all the time. So it means it doesn't run as many cycles per okay so fewer steps per operation risk chipsets are more expensive is it because they're risky yeah um they're actually quite uh more efficient uh they were the high-end chipsets that servers and that used to um, run, whereas CISC was the more common one. Threads and hyperthreads. <coughs> so this is basically where we get them to run different sets of codes at the same time through the CPU. So when we're talking about the basic Intel chips, the i3, i5, i7. So you basically went to, if I remember this correctly, we had basically the way it worked was you had your core and then you introduced your core with threading and then multi-core with threading. So the I5 is, okay, so I think from memory I3, I'd have to look it up to double confirm, but from memory I3 was like a dual core with threading, which gave you four cores. Your I5 was a true four core with no threading. And the i7 was the four core with hyper threading, which gave you an eight core system. Uh -huh. AMD processors use hyper transport, um, which is pretty much the same thing. You end up with multiple calls. Now, when we're talking about calls in these newer machines, we're talking about the number of um, threads or sections of code it can process in one cycle 
So it's equivalent to having eight different CPUs running at the same time. The speed of the processor is measured in megahertz and gigahertz, which is how many cycles per second it can run. And the data amount that that CPU can process is fully dependent on the front side bus size. So when we do overclocking on CPUs, we talk about um, increasing the speed, the clock speed. And so we're changing the gigahertz or megahertz speed of the chipset. Um, now, one of the problems with that is we can introduce uh, too much heat into the CPU. Most CPUs have inbuilt protections that kick in around the 80, 85 degree mark, which will cause it to throttle down and um, protect itself. Okay, so CPU virtualization, when we get in the VM virtual machines, it, one of the things you need to set in the BIOS is um, enable virtual machines. So you're basically doing this, the CPU virtualization. So supporting multiple operating systems on the same hardware, which is set in the BIOS, the support feature. So we're about halfway through. All right, so multi-core processors, Single core, dual core, triple core, quad, hex, and octal. Now, I believe the i9s go up to 12 core now. Um, I haven't had a look at that because I get depressed when I go window shopping and I know I can't buy it. So, until the boss gives me the budget, I, I don't look. <laughs> because I know I can't buy, so no, it's a sad state of affairs. All right. Um, I feel your pain. Yeah. <laughs> GPUs, graphic um, processing units. So this is our, our dedicated graphics unit. So this will do all the pretty calculations freeing up the main CPU to continue with the core important calculations of running the machine. So this is why we have these high end graphics cards that have high speed GPUs and some of them actually have multiple GPUs on these boards as well now. So they're quite a nice change to what used to be. Cooling fans. Now we have, we spoke about the heat sinks in the last chapter, and basically we need case cooling fans to circulate the air through the case. The heat sinks and the fans mounted on CPUs are all about removing the heat off the component, but it's still in the case. So we need case fans to actually move the air through the case to get rid of that hot air. Otherwise, the inside of the case is just going to, temperature is going to build up and you won't get efficient cooling. So we have the CPU fans cooling, so we've got nice big heat sinks with fans, which with the fan attached to the heat sink, it's known as active cooling. If there's just the heat sink, it's passive cooling. And graphic cards are now coming out with massive heat sinks and fans on them because the GPUs are generating massive amounts of heat as well because they're getting faster and processing more information. 
And now you can actually use liquid cooling within computers. Now they come in solid tubing or flexible tubing and just make sure that you have the pump or one of the radio fans plugged into the CPU fan pins or else you'll have trouble with the BIOS because the BIOS by default monitors the CPU fan as part of its protection loop. So if it can't get a circuit through the, the CPU fan, it believes the CPU fan is faulty and stops to protect the CPU from cooking. Now, with RAID, this is where we have multiple hard drives stacked together protecting our data. So some of them you can do just by a single one. It's not recommended, but you could. Um, but striving, so basically it's writing across multiple drives. But if a single drive fails, all the data is lost. So there's no data recovery possibility by just using striping across multiple drives. Or what you get with striping is a speed increase because it's writing to multiple drives at once. So it's increasing the speed. Mirroring is a duplicate information. So it writes the same information to multiple drives at once. Parity basically is fault tolerant and basic error checking across the drives. So what parity allows you to do is rebuild a failed drive out of the others. Yeah. And double parity allows you to rebuild two failed drives out of an array. Now, yeah. what you do is you generally do a combination of them. Okay, so you take advantage of striping to get speed, but you also combine it with parity so that you can rebuild a failed drive if you need to. So you get the speed benefit and with the of striping, but the security of rebuilding your data with the parity. So on the left hand side here, you've got all your combination of RAID levels and basically it's a combination of the features that makes it more secure and more reliable. Now, the, these aren't generally used at home. They're at enterprise level. So if you had NAS and you were protecting important data, then you might want to have RAID. Most motherboards will support some form of RAID combinations in today's environment. You five terabyte hard drives. Whoa. With RAID 5. Hmm. How's your performance increased over those? Pretty good. Jacob? Yeah. Just mostly for storage. All right. Fair enough. It does allow, give you a slightly increase in performance being the stripe but it gives you that 
that security for, well I shouldn't say security peace of mind knowing that if one of the drives fail you can rebuild that missing data from the priority checks from the other three so if you don't got a lot of data in there that certainly pays for itself okay so ports serial ports video ports all these lovely um, so over here this used to be our mouse port our serial connector nine pin serial connector that one there is your VGA connector that is the old parallel port which is um, printers used to be connected to back in the day so <laughs> um game ports the yellow one so joysticks um it's also known as a midi port so any of the musos out there that they would have used to connect into the midi port for their keyboards and stuff like that and now we have the ps2 mouse and keyboard combination and then our built-in um, audio ports now that's the one and only port that most of us will use which is our just our stereo out and then we'll have mic in and um, different channels for those people that have got five in ones and all that sort of stuff so the dvis are generally a white cable sock plug okay and then you've got the hdmi now these hdmis and display ports come in a small form factor as well as the normal size so you get a mini HDMI and a mini display port as well. And the USBs are the same. So you've got the USB and mini and micro or A and B. Some people refer to them as. All right. So you've also got the lightning connectors. SATA connectors are the ones you'll um, be more interested in. So you have your SATA data, which is and power. So this one's your data. And that one's your power connector. So these are keyed, so they've got an L-shaped slot, so they only go in one way. They don't, most of these only go in one way. Same with the external SATA connectors for external drives and so forth. They basically only go in one way. They're keyed. Okay. Um, in today's environment, a lot of motherboards will support this. Um, on the older ones, you will have to buy expansion cards to um, support that. Twisted care cabling will, um, the, I'll go th through how all of this works when we start getting into the CCNA stuff. Just be aware that you have unshielded twisted pair and shielded twisted pair. So basically with unshielded, it uses the twists to cancel out interference between each of the, the wires to each other. And each pair is twisted at a different rate and then all four pairs are twisted 
amongst themselves within the cable. So basically the way it works is the um, magnetic forces that are you caused by current moving through um, cancel each other out. So the positive ne negative magnetic forces um, work against each other and cancel each other out. So all our network cables run on RJ45 connectors under UGP and SDP. And we used to run a CAT3 cable on RJ11, which is your standard telephone jack. Um, coax cable was more widely used for TV antennas. Okay, so the cable going from your wall up to your aerial on the roof was a coax cable. And this was the first cable type that we used to use in Ethernet. And this is why we say Ethernet is a bus, because we'd have a coax cable running out, and then we would put a T piece in and T off the line. So that'll come more apparent when we go back into doing our networking. And with that, we have the various connectors that come along with coax cable connection, BNC connection being one of the most common types. They actually twist lock. Um, the RG6 and 59 are used with your cable TV and satellite TV and that sort of stuff. SCSI is still around in enterprise levels, not so much in the home environment anymore. SATA is where it's happening now. And the good thing about SCSI is you could actually daisy chain devices one after the other. And each device would have a unique identifier along the cable and you could communicate independently to each other. So it's quite a good system. Um, IDEs were the first um, hard drives and they basically had a slight um, difference in the pins for the master slave position on the cable. So basically, I doubt very much you would see any computers with ID cables in it in this day and age. There should be, all be SATAs. Monitors. So we need screen size, which is measured via inches across the diagonal points. The resolution is in dots per inch. So the number of pixels, if you like, or dots, so 1920 by 1080 is our high, dent, high def. So this is how much resolution or how much information we can display on the screen at the time. Native resolution is the best resolution for the monitor. Okay. And connectivity is referring to the connection types used. So VGI, HDMI, display ports. Um, brightness. Contrast are all adjustable within the settings on the monitor. Refresh rates with these new LCD monitors and that, you tend not to be able to adjust the refresh rates. On the old CRT monitors, you could adjust that to suit. 
refresh rate is the number of seconds it takes or the number of cycles for the image to be rebuilt so especially on the CRT so it used to have a ray that used to scan across the back of the cathode and for it to totally rebuild the image on the screen is what the refresh rate basically is and interlaced and non interlaced so odd and even lines so it's got to do with how it rebuilt the image so you probably wouldn't even think about anything below full high definition in today's environment some of you probably don't even want to talk about anything below ultra high day your 4k resolution i know a few uh people that um swear by 4k and yes they are computer geeks and yes they live by themselves <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah they're, they're, they're the only ones that i know of that um swear by 4k because they're the ones with disposable income well, i i uh, saw the 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 video recordings that had like static all through the picture and because the the tape on the video was damaged or just oh yeah it had been watched that many times that it was just where it came. Yeah. And also, if the um, the information, because the way the refreshing would work, you'd occasionally um, miss bits of the refresh yeah. as well. So that that's what the snowy effect. Um, most computers now have multiple monitor support built in. Um, my graphic card supports four monitors off my graphics card without having to um, put in a second card. Um, it'd be worth, worth it if my um, fourth monitor didn't die just recently. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, these little sacrifices we will make running on three instead of four. <laughs> you poor thing. <laughs> oh, I'm not playing Eve anymore, which is basically why I got the four monitors. So I used to run eight characters at once. So um, I was a little addicted to Eve, yes. <laughs> That's insane. Um, let's just say I, I now play other. Um, games i don't understand how you could like cope with eight characters at once uh it's interesting um the structure of the game allowed a commander of a wing to issue orders for the entire wing so i would have all my guys in my own wing and on my primary character I would issue orders that affected all of them at once. So, oh, okay. Um, it was so you weren't very... actually in control of your other ones. They were. No, no. I could individually issue orders, but in emergency situations, like when somebody came to kill you, you would order the emergency warp as a a um wing command so everybody would get the command to evac at once oh yeah um rather than having to swap all the characters and do all that you would just do it as one command so that was what good. about like fighting can you like yeah you can do it um normally if i was fighting i would just play with one oh yeah um uh, because dog fights um are only a matter of um like 30 seconds and it's over oh okay for the most part um yeah so you tend just to run one all right motherboards we've talked about that in last yep. chapter 
So things you can upgrade on motherboards are basically your CPU, your RAM, and your adapter cards. Okay, so um, each time you increase your RAM, you increase get a slight increase in performance um, because the more memory a computer has to work in, the less it has to page out to the hard drives. So that increases your performance. Changing the speed of your CPU will generate more heat. So you will need probably to upgrade the heatsink and fan combinations that you are using there. And you know your adapters cards can be swapped in and out depending on your needs. I'm not going to read that. You basically make sure you all your power's off. Disconnect all your cables, unplug what it is you're swapping out, and reverse the process to put it all back together. I'll let you read the step-by-step -step instruction. Um, CPU, just make sure, a couple of things if you're going to upgrade your CPU. Make sure it's the same socket type. All right. So as we said in last chapter, we've got a specific set of sockets for Intel and AMD. And each motherboard will have a list of CPUs that it will support under its BIOS. Okay, so check your motherboard book documentation to find out which CPUs that motherboard will support. It's no use buying a CPU that your motherboard doesn't support. You need to buy a new motherboard then. Storage, swapping out um, hard drives. Again, make sure all your power's turned off, unplug your cables, unscrew it, and replace it. Now, if you've got spare interfaces, you can just add more drives in by mounting it into the slot and adding additional cables. You can get power splitters because some of the um, power supplies don't come up with enough connectors, especially if you've got um, optical drives and lots of hard drives in the same box. So you may need to buy power splitters to um, split the power across the drives. Peripheral upgrades, unplug, just with everything else, make sure you power down your system before you change any of these devices. Unless it is a wireless keyboard and mouse, generally speaking, you can just, because they plug in to the receiver on a USB port. USBs are designed to be hot swappable, so you can do those via while live. But if it's a wired keyboard and wired mouse, just power down. It is safer. All right, power supply upgrades. Um, again, make sure it's all powered down, disconnected, and Generally speaking, it is four screws that hold in the power supply. So under your case, under the four screws for the power supply, under all the connectors, slot in the new one, redo the screws, replug in all your connectors, and away you go. Thin and thick clients, um, basically where most of the computing is done in a central location and um, limited processing is done out on the client side. Okay, these were how mainframes used to work. You had the mainframe and then basically thin clients running around to interface with the mainframe. Now, this is 
starting to come back as you know we're going to this um, cloud type service we're starting to see um, our desktops be referred to as thin clients because most of our data processing is now being done by those remote servers in the clouds so thin clients are now starting to reappear our traditional what we would normally think as a desktop is our thick client where each of them would run locally NAS network attached storage is where we have a centrally located bank of hard drives to be able to store all of our files we could stream videos do automatic backups post web pages do whatever we want with storage and they're all accessible across the network all right protecting the environment so disposing of all those nasty bits and pieces in a environmentally friendly way so toner cartridges taken back to be recycled um, office works have recycle bins um, with our electronics so our uh, monitors our desktops and all that pull them apart and put them into appropriate um, e-waste disposal systems most of the um, councils have e-waste drop-off points and then when you're doing cleaning and that hopefully you're using environmentally stable cleaning product um, so that's our green um, listing for today uh, um, one of the ramifications of environment friendly stuff and handling potentially toxic chemicals and that is businesses are now required to maintain safety data sheets or material safety data sheets as they used to be known which basically say what the material is what's hazardous about it what safety precautions and first aid um, steps you should take if you're exposed to it okay now they are a requirement under Australian law as well as American all right so in summary we talked about setting up the BIOS basic introduction into the principles of electrical power we explored a little bit more about the functionality of components in how the cabling and that work we had a brief introduction into monitors and I um, very quickly brushed over the environmental stuff so in today's in day and age you guys are all fully aware of environmental impacts of things now it is taught in everything we do now okay so I will uh, stop that one put Tim up on the big screen stop the recording